All right. So welcome to everyone who's just now joining. Um, we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, I do want to talk about a few housekeeping things. So if everyone can keep their microphones on mute, that'll just help with the, the noise that we all have in the background. Uh, we will have a time for questions at the end, but in the meantime, please put all your questions in the chat box. Um, these will be public unless you specifically select me or Shaz or Mimir, and then we can answer those privately. Um, so let's go through this orientation pretty quickly. Let's first start with some Fulbright Association staff. As you all know, um, those of you that have been with us for, uh, for longer than you know, a few years, we do have some new people on here. So let's just briefly touch on this. Thank Our executive you. director is John Bader. Our deputy director is Shaz Akram. Our associate director is Munir Sayeg. Our development manager is Naomi Guzman. And I'm Christine Oswald, the manager of membership and programs. But for most things chapter related, you will go through me or Shaz and Munir can help with the communication side of things. All right, so the role of the national office, we are the, the organization that you guys can come to for help. We set and enforce policy. We enroll all Fulbright Association members. We can give advice for programming and we also collect all membership dues. And these dues are given back to chapters in a portion called the membership rebate, which we're kind of working on distributing right now. Um, we maintain the group tax exemption because we are a 501c3. Um, we also have a database of all of the alumni and we provide lists of those, um, those alumni to our chapters. If you have not received your membership alumni or your membership list, please go ahead and send me an email after this and I'll make sure I get it to you once we receive your form. Um, programming advice, again, we maintain websites, online event calendars and newsletter and these are all opportunities for chapters to publicize their events. Um, we are gonna skip over this uh, this top portion of the slide, we do have something called a chapter advisory board, but it is on hold at the moment. Um, another thing I want to touch on is advocacy. This is a huge part of the Fulbright Association in general. A big mission for us is to advocate for the funding of the Fulbright program. And each chapter would ideally have an advocacy director for spearheading local advocacy in your state. So let's go into the role of the chapter. And just to try to clarify on the structure, we have the national office and then all of our chapters are affiliates. So every chapter has a basic leadership structure. You have your executive members, the president, vice president, treasurer, and secretary, and then in total, no more than 15 board members. All board members must be current members of the Fulbright Association. And I did get a recent question about whether or not friends of Fulbright can be on the board, but yes, you don't have to be a Fulbright alum, you just have to be a Fulbright Association member. Um, chapters all follow bylaws, which we are working on uh, reworking these bylaws. And when we make those changes, we will bring that up to you and make those clear. And then we also have a chapter handbook, which is available on our website. Chapters should be contacting alumni in the area, inviting them to join the association, association and participate in other chapter activities. Um, annually, we need chapters to have at least two programs that discuss international education and cultural exchange. So one of the big things that we're talking about in this webinar is sharing events with the national office. So we have a, a new system, which I'll touch on in a few slides, where you can just submit your events to, into our website to go directly onto our calendar, because this is the only way that we're able to advertise your events and share them with the rest of our membership. Again, I'll touch on that in a little bit. Advocating for the Fulbright program and then submitting the annual report, which we um, Shaz will talk about in a little bit. Chapter bylaws, just a brief overview. All chapter members must be members of the Fulbright Association. The board of directors provide oversight and hold regular meetings. Um, the elections must be open to the entire chapter. Officers serve one year term, president two year terms, and each of these are renewable uh, once. The annual collection should be managed by the national office. All you have to do is send us an email, tell us which positions are open, and we can send out a call for nominations to chapter members. And like I mentioned before, bylaws will be updated this year. Shaz, did you wanna chime in on anything with elections? 
Oh, sorry, I, um, I was on mute. Um, yes, I just wanted to make uh, uh, just a, a point that we are looking to um, ed edit our bylaws and match them with the same cycle as our national uh, board bylaws. Uh, we will probably be changing the terms of, uh, uh, of board members. So uh, three years for each board member renewable for an additional three years. This is something many on the, on the chapter uh, boards for many years have spoken to me, have some chapters edit their own bylaws to suit the need of where they are physically, geographically uh, located, uh, lack of enough board members to sign up for board terms. So there's been some kind of flexibility in adjusting bylaws on a need to need basis. But I, we are looking at renewing the bylaws, making them a bit more broader, uh, longer terms. And um, I will be reaching out to some of you to help in that work, uh, create a working group for editing the bylaws, because I think input from you guys is more crucial. Um, and uh, it's uh, so that's that's that uh, the election part beyond your routine cycle of elections, we're looking at, uh, at taking a deeper dive into editing our bylaws. So keep that in mind. Um, that's it, Christine. Thanks, Shaz. All right. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning, I am so impressed by all of your chapters for you know, being innovative during this time with all of your virtual events. I love seeing it. It seems like your members are really enjoying them. And I've personally really enjoyed the events that I've been able to attend. Um, but just some, a few things to keep in mind as you're planning your chapter events, we have some themes to focus on. The first is diversity. So holding events that are of interest to a wide range of members and also vary in content. Um, digital community engagement, which is obviously new since everything's virtual right now. So work on promoting the chapter, the Fulbright Association, and the program itself, itself. and this includes advocacy outreach. Um, and adjusting this to the digital world is something that, you know, talking with other chapter leaders can be really helpful, asking us for programmatic advice. We're always willing to brainstorm with you, um, but so many of you have been doing an awesome job, so congratulations. Um, and then lastly, we really want to focus on alumni and young professional networking. Um, we do have a young professional um, membership type, and a lot of our young professionals have given us feedback that um, networking is a huge draw for them when they're part of this organization. So if you can create events that cater to that, that would be great. Okay, so on the right, you'll see a screenshot of our January calendar. This is it's just an image from our calendar on the national website that everyone can access. And so we do have some chapter events listed, but there have been so many more that have happened in January, but we just haven't gotten the information to put them on the calendar. So I am going to just quickly take you to the calendar. Okay, so this is just under about calendar event, calendar of events, and you see our national calendar. This is for February. Let's see January. All right, so you can see the different the different events here. You can click on them. See the descriptions. Leave comments, find out how to register. And then on the calendar underneath, you can actually see a list of upcoming events with a little more descriptions. Now, this is the new feature that Munir just set up for us. You can submit your own events to the calendar. So you just put in your event name, all of the details, put in pictures, descriptions, and then I will go through and approve that to be put on our website. And having the events on this calendar is how we can make sure that we're advert advertising for you on our social media, putting these events in our newsletter. Um, so it's really crucial that we are included in this. And I think it's a win-win for both of us. Let's see. Another thing I wanted to talk about briefly while I'm still showing my screen, um, you can share your chapter spotlight with the Fulbright community. So if you have an event you wanted to talk about or some sort of chapter accomplishment, um, you can go ahead and submit this on our website. And I believe this is going to be included under chapter resources, which is just under chapters, chapter resources, 
right there. So if you submit this and then Munir can um, go through these and potentially feature them in a newsletter. Munir, is there anything else you wanted to say about this? Yeah, um, just that the, um, yeah, the spotlight, it'll be under chapter resources um, for, the, for the event portion for the calendar. If we go back to that, the reason that we have decided that we really need you, the, the national calendar is a great place for chapter events. In the past, most events have been local, but since the pandemic, a lot of digital events, people might be attending your events from other chapters. So it's a great way to get your, your um, obviously you have your own way of advertising your events, but this is a good way for us to tell the broader membership because people you know, can go to a digital book, book club, even if they don't live in Minnesota or something. So anyway, it's just, uh, it's under calendar of events and you just scroll down and you can see it. There's also on the chapter resources page, a link to the submission as well. And you can, if you wanna to go to chapter resources, uh, Christine, you can see the, um, the links there. there. There should be the second ones. So the add a chapter event and then a chapter spotlight submission. So both of those links work and they will go to the place to submit. Um, it is a new feature. So if you run into any issues, please just let us know and we can help you. Yeah, definitely. All right, thanks, Vineer. Um, Let's see. Uh-oh, it restarted my presentation. Bear with me. Um, while Christine is getting to the right page, I just wanted to emphasize the importance of um, you all letting us know your events in advance. Um, we mostly find out as you communicate your events to membership, um, as we are on listservs of various kinds, we find out from third partners, party partners about events you are partnering with other organizations with. Um, what is happening is it's the 75th year of the Fulbright program. State Department is really emphasizing submission of events and we want to sort of give your chapter due spotlight. So if you give us your advanced series of events that you've planned for the year, we're able to put in a registration within our newsletter every month for people to join. Since they're digital programs, you can suddenly expand your reach and showcase the great programming you've been putting together during the pandemic, even um, despite the challenges. So think about that, how we can work together. Uh, ultimately, we're trying to help you guys. We're also trying to see where we can pull you in to co-program with stuff we're doing rather than recreate a program that you've thought about. We wouldn't go that way. We would just say, oh, you thought about this? We'll just partner with you on this. So, so to give you examples, um, we, we just, we, we've got to do much better in consolidating what our alumni community is producing uh, to, to get you get guys better spotlights within the community as well as within State Department and, and in, in the whole big picture of the 75th celebration globally. So. Um, yeah, and speaking of partnerships, I've noticed a lot of chapters partnering with one another to, to sponsor events, and that's really great. It expands the reach. Um, and so I would encourage more of you to reach out to other chapter leaders and try to, I don't know, brainstorm on events and see what we can come up with, because it's really great. Um, a few more things about programming. Uh, one of the branding techniques you can use uh, is called Fulbright Forum. So if you're having events where you're having a speaker or a discussion, you can call that a Fulbright Forum and that falls in line with our branding. Um, we also have Fulbright in the Classroom, which I, th I think Shaz is gonna touch on a little bit later in terms of a grant we received. Um, please, keep continue, uh, please continue to submit event reports because we can use those for blog posts, newsletters, chapter spotlights, alumni spotlights. And that can be through that link that I just showed you on chapter resources. Um, yeah, I think, I think that covers it. And Shaz is going to talk a bit about the annual report. Oh, I think you're on mute. 
Oh, sorry about that. Okay. Since you all received the annual report, thank you for us. Many of you have started submitting it to us already. Really appreciate it. Um, we are trying to make it less cumbersome. So we're going to work on further making it uh, easy process. But for now, there are a lot of parts in it that don't apply. I mean, you've done a lot of digital programming. So just highlight what the programs you've done. Uh, we've tried to edit as much as possible. So Christine, if you want to pull the report up, um, we could show you uh, exactly where the edits have occurred. Um, like it's impossible to expect you guys to go to the uh, local uh, Congress, you know, congressional office or um, local offices to advocate for the Fulbright program. But, you know, if you've made a phone call, you can easily say did some outreach for advocacy purposes, um, as an example, and then list all the digital programming you've done and what social media you used. Other, other complication is the um, chapters, uh, the event summaries, right? So the event summaries are created purely for the purpose of the grant, grant reporting. Uh, with so many things off since last, late last year to this year, and with no sign of what we expect from State Department uh, in terms of a chapter grant, we still think an event summary is a useful tool, but it doesn't, you know, it's complicated. You can't put a budget in there because you didn't get funding for this. You can't say, oh, X amount of foreign students attended, X amount of alumni attended. So we have to be sort of creative about how you guys can report on the events you're doing without all the other details. You can continue to use existing event summaries but know that we don't expect you to fill every line of it. We would like just the summary of the event and who you partnered with and some photographs, because that's, what, that's why we've created the online blog submission spotlight way uh, mode of reporting, because we can quickly get your story out there. I mean, it's really nice. We have, as of today, 60,000 people on our mailing list. Uh, they're not all members, but they are Fulbright alumni through the census. So 60,000 people who have subscribed to our mailing list can know about what Arizona is doing, what Chicago is doing, what Austin is doing, you know, what San Antonio is doing. I mean, it's just incredible. Why wouldn't you want to use that mode of advertising your events? So um, the other thing is just... Um, uh, Christine, if you can scroll down a bit on this report, um, the changes we've made are more of, you know, the digital, how can you digitally report? And on the advocacy section also, you know, um, it's all about phone calls or mailing. Are you including people, staffers in your email invites for your digital programming? So I just wanted to make sure that you don't get bogged down by this big report. You do the best you can. And it's okay not to, it's okay to say even that you didn't have any events later in the year. Um, some of you did have in-person events earlier part of the year, all the way till March or April even. Uh, so put all that there, but all the stuff that you were not able to do, um, you know, it's okay to leave a lot of stuff blank, but just an explanation that obviously due to the pandemic, we didn't have any events. We haven't done any digital events, whatever the case is. And the other thing I wanna point out is going forward, you can, due to the limitation of money coming to the to chapters, you could fundraise from your membership list in the sense that here, these are the events we're planning for this year and we do not have a chapter grant this year, would you consider making a additional donation to the chapter directly to hold an event, for instance? Or could you sponsor an event? Or could you sponsor a webinar we're doing? It's okay to ask your members that on an individual chapter basis. 
So I wanted to just highlight those things so that you could sort of explore a broader picture on how to handle, you know, the challenges we're all facing this year. Um, Christine, we can, we can get out of it and you can continue so, so that we can get to questions in the end. Okay, great. Um, let's see. Shaz, do you wanna continue with banking and IRS requirements? Yeah, this is, again, we're working with um, all, this is just for those of the chapter leaders that are new in this, uh, this uh, webinar. We have to report all our 54 chapters or affiliates under FA. FA gives a huge report submission in the fall, identifying that all its 54 chapters are active. You guys um, submit a 990E postcard also but we ultimately remind uh, IRS about the active nature of all our affiliates. Um, every chapter has an EIN number. You have to apply for that on your own, but um, you know, we have a group exemption, but it's only for federal, federal uh, exemption. Um, if you go to the next slide, um, you can have up to 50,000 in your account I wish we had 50,000 in each chapter's account. That would be um, a Christmas present of great magnitude. But unfortunately, that's not the case. But you can have up to 50,000 and you're still, tax, uh, you're still in that tax exemption for groups. Um, we have, um, yeah, that's, I think that's all we need to talk about here. If any of you, many of you I'm working with, uh, I have to send Jim you a, a letter for a bank, uh, opening a bank account. If you need those kind of letters, you know, you let us know, we, we write, we issue those, we have a template. Um, if you need any help with IRS, if you've not filed taxes one year and you need to get reinstated, if you need some kind of letter from us, that's, we can be of help there as well. Um, let's keep going. Uh, the next, uh, and here, I'll, I'll just chime in here that this is our process. Usually the chapter grant starts in, you report on your final grant on the, by the 30th of June. We send out a new call for submissions in end of July, early August. Chapters submit their grant proposals end of August, early September. End of September, we have assigned funds to all the chapters that applied and qualified for the chapter grant. The grant year starts 1st of October, but it's, it's an ECA grant, but it is administered by IIE. So we, we're a subrecipient in a way. Um, so, but there, this didn't happen last year. So I want you to all know about it, but we, we haven't received visiting Fulbrighter lists, scholar lists, everything is on stat, uh, hold right now globally. We don't know whether international Fulbrighters are coming to the country. We don't know whether US students or scholars are going abroad. And many of you on this webinar have applied for grants. You all must note, we, uh, we're all on hold. We're all waiting to know what's happening, who's gotten the grant. So we just can't give you answers because we don't know. And I wanna sort of make a, emphasize this and apologize. Um, we just don't know anything. So we can't tell you anything. It's not that we're not purposely um, not sharing information. We just don't, we, they're not giving us complete information. So we, we are assuming at this point that they will give us the new grant in the 21-22 cycle, which is fall of this year. But we're still not sure. And we know that we were supposed to get some 75th funding this year, but they keep force, um, they keep stressing that because of the pandemic, everything is virtual. Even their uh, ECA is going to conduct all the uh, training for their grantees virtually. Um, there is no funding being given to the anchor cities either because there's no in-person programming. Um, so we've heard from some commissions that they will be chartering flights to bring their Fulbrighters to the US. 
but everything is, as you know, Europe is under lockdown, most of it with the new strain, everything is up in the air. At this point, we just can't make any plans. So my thinking is why stress, why stress us uh, ourselves on something we can't control, but think about how you can empower your chapter throughout your own outreach to your members and see what you can do within those confined you know, limitations. Um, so even though we, we know we might, we might get a grant, but we don't know, we might get funding, we don't know, this will drive all of us crazy. That's my point. <laughs> it, it's enough to drive you crazy. So no clarity whatsoever from ECA on additional funding for 75th or year end funding. But it's safe to say we assume things will get a little bit normal at the end of the year so that we can get some funding to our chapters. Uh, we can go to the next slide. Oh, I'm gonna hand over to Christine at this point. Um, actually, I think Munir is gonna touch on this. I got you. Um, for those who are new, um, we are not complete sticklers. No, we actually are, we are. We are sticklers on branding. So please adhere to all branding guidelines. On the chapter resources page, you'll find the actual full branding guideline for the Fulbright program. And we also, since we are, um, uh, our brand is branding is the same as theirs, we adhere to the same branding guidelines. So if you have any questions, so please don't put your chapter stuff all over in weird places. So you see Brazos Valley, Massachusetts chapter, that's how your logo is supposed to appear. Anything else is technically a violation of the brand. All right, you can go to the next one. Um, just again, an overview for anyone new. Um, the chapter have their own websites, their own email address, um, and some have their own MailChimp account. Um, you don't have to use any of these, but it's highly recommended because they're there and you might as well. Um, and it's at no cost to chapters. Um, we also have our CRM called uh, YM, your membership. And that is a place where you can search existing members. Um, you can find people in your local area based on a directory. Um, you can log in, uh, find all sorts of stuff. Um, so that's really great. Uh, the, on here, the Fulbrighter app isn't on here, but there is a Fulbrighter app. It's called fulbrighternetwork.com. Um, that's a place you can find um, Fulbrighters, hopefully visiting Fulbrighters at some point you will find on there. Um, but anyway, that platform has about 20,000 users and it's pretty great. Um, but yeah, please use these tools to the best of your ability. On the chapter of resources page, there are a webinar um, button where you can fi find past webinars where we've gone over the tools for these, these things, such as using your website, um, the Fulbrighter app and um, communicating with your members. Um, yeah, and if you have questions, my email's there. Um, I'll, I'll type in the, the chat, the Fulbrighter app uh, website. Um, for that, you have to be a Fulbright alum. They will confirm with the commission of where you went. So that is only for Fulbrighters. Um, unlike the other platforms like our membership, you can be a full friend of Fulbrighter. So, um, but yeah, if you have other questions that are chapter specific about your website and such, please let me know. Um, thank you. That's it. All right. We do have a few deadlines we wanted to go over. Um, as, as you know, the annual reports are due on February 28th, um, the 990 May 15th chapter grant deadlines subject to change. We will keep you updated on that. Chapter awards, August 30th, membership drive, November 30th. Again, you will receive more information from us as these approach. Shaz, did you wanna talk about the new exciting possibilities for chapter funding? So yes, sure. Um, I, as I was, as, as an organization, we were all thinking, how can we support our chapters in this really dry, tight period? Um, which has actually created a beautiful digital world of programming, um, amazing access, you know, for a lot of people to attend programs. 
money is short. So we, we thought um, that if we still have a chapter award for any kind of programming you guys did, that would, we would have that in the fall. If we're not able to have a conference in person, we can still virtually have a chapters award. So ceremony, so to speak, in which each chapter can present their unique type of programming that they put together. Then we also thought we, in the past, many of you that are old timers like me will remember we've done some membership drives in coordination with um, International Education Week and things like that. So I thought this was an exciting way of sort of getting your help. Uh, we have a retention problem in membership. So we've gotten a lot of new members through the census and we're continuing to work that way off. But sometimes the older, when I say older, I don't mean age-wise, just members who have been members for many years don't continue or don't renew. So that's the, where the retention comes in. We would love you to reach out to your, the lapsed members from your chapter and see if you could get them to come on board. So with a membership recruitment drive, again, the chapter that brings renews you know, the largest amount of members, we could do some sort of a prize for that that would be substantial enough to, to be worth the chapter's while, the board's while, so to speak. So that's another idea that we are thinking about. We wanted to share it with you. Then we got a 20K grant from a foundation to support the FIC program. Now the FIC program, as all of you know, for Bright in the Classroom has been sitting under the chapters uh, umbrella when we piloted it a couple of years ago, 2017 to be exact. Um, and this is one of those uh, uh, signature programs that was very dear to John Bader, our executive director, and he was, uh, uh, you know, he put that together. We can possibly give $500 per individual through a competitive, you would have to apply for the FIC program. It is from, um, it's elementary school all the way to college. We're doing a lot of outreach to HBCUs and underserved community colleges and underserved communities. Um, if you are able to, I want you to think about this creatively, one individual can apply for this grant on behalf of the chapter, and it's a virtual presentation. State Department is also trying to work with us on matching a teacher with a alumni and a classroom. Your chapter could get that $500. If it's a compelling presentation, it's a good one, it gets approved, that's going to be rolled out in the spring. That's another way of getting a $500 small modest grant, but to your chapter. You don't need to, you don't need to travel, you will only have to use your own Zoom account to uh, present to a classroom or to a class in a college setting, whatever the case may be. The details and the training will be forthcoming. State Department is also gonna work with us on our training and our materials. So you will get good stuff, but it is focused on the individual because obviously the chapter board cannot sit and do a classroom presentation. Uh, you know, it'll be just too many people. So it's something for you guys to think about and work on how you would do it. So these are other exciting possibilities for additional funding in this rather dry period of our programming. Um, Christine, any other next slide? Uh, I think we're, uh, yeah, okay. Yeah, I mean, just a few, a few last, um, last minute things. Um, please make sure that chapters at Fulbright.org is copied on all emails and that that, um, that email is subscribed to your newsletters and your chapter announcements. 
um, send all finalized events, event dates to us, or you can use the, the um, new feature on our calendar where you submit your events, because we would love to highlight your chapter, um, your events in our newsletter and our social media. Um, and for everyone who's new, our chapter resources have a lot of information. I encourage you to go through and really read through everything, watch old webinars. That's all available on our website. Um, and with that, let's go ahead and take some questions. I think we have some in the chat. Let's see. I was going to just repeat some of the questions from the previous. Um, one question was about uh, board uh, term limits for the board members or the president. Um, I think people are asking if it's a one-year term or a two-year term and they were confused by the slides. That was the first question. About current terms or the ones that will be changing with the bylaws? I, I guess both, I'm not sure. Okay, well, current terms, it's um, one-year term for board members and um, that's renewable one time. For presidents, it's a two-year term, and that is also renewable one time. And then, sh so sh I just wanted to cross-check: it's a one-year term for presidents, renewable another time. So oh. it's a two years. <laughs> yes, mix that one up there. Yes. So, um, and then changes, Shaz. What did you say the changes were going to be? So we're trying to, we're, we haven't, this is gonna take a like legal process to change our bylaws, but we are going to make the board terms for board members from two years to three years and renewable two times. So you, a board member can serve three years and then get reelected for another three year term. So total six years. But the president, the reason we limited presidents um, and there is some, there is some flexibility there too, because sometimes there's just nobody who's willing to take on the role, but that should be a decision by the board them collectively that, okay, none of us want to run for president and there's really nobody in the community who wants to do it. So should we let X, Y, and Z continue for another year? The reason we limited it to one year renewable a second year was to give board members a chance to step into that leadership role and that one person doesn't sit in that role for years and years. So it's kind of like a you know, fair way of sharing leadership. Um, and sometimes people take breaks, they go off the board for a couple of years and come back and can become presidents again. We have no limitations on that either, but it is very important to allow people to have the choice to be a president as well if they want to. The, the next question was um, about posting the chapter events to the national calendar. Uh, Darlene had a question that, how would we know if that person who finds our event is a member? So I, I assume Darlene, I don't know if you have clarification on that question, but I think it's a good question. Um, Darlene, are you asking about like member only uh, meetings or events that you wouldn't want to advertise that publicly? No, it's not just advertising publicly, but our platform for our events has a limit of 100 people. So on April 9th, when we have a salute to Senator Fulbright and a big celebration, we're inviting all the people from the region. And typically when it's not online, we have 74 people. So if we open it up to others, we don't wanna take away slots from our members. So I was brainstorming, do we have to have like priority given to members and then regional people and then outsiders? I mean, that's that's a lot of work to sort I out. Was, I would say that if you have limits to technology, one thing is, um, you know, looking to upgrade if you want to. Otherwise, if you want to keep it under 100, I would definitely say then you probably should uh, maybe not advertise it publicly and only within your own membership. Okay, we'd and love to open it up if it's possible. So, but so Darlene, I have one suggestion. Um, let it be open. I would let people register. I, 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 I would let it, let it show you how many people really register. Many times people register and I've noticed through our Zoom virtual world that if 80 people register, about a third of them actually turn up attending the event. Not all of them come. And the reason is it's easy and free to register 
I would recommend, and I know many of you disagree with me on this, but I would recommend putting $10 fee to register. And once they've attended the event, you can reimburse that money back to them. I know it's a lot of work, but that is pushing them to really invest in this meeting and save that slot. You need to pay $10 to reserve a slot. And you know, $10 is not a lot, but if they don't turn up, the chapter gets to keep that money. And it's, you know, it's, it's something to think about. And Meryl, I see you on this call. Um, you guys are do an excellent way of charging uh, programming for your programming. You actually, the Northern California chapter charges uh, for their events. And well, tell us about your attendance. With the events where people, we, we don't have uh, some kind of ticketing fee, um, we have the same problem everybody else is having that people don't particularly show up, you know, 30% to 50%, depending on the event. But where we do charge a little bit, and it's always a nominal fee. And usually what we do is, you know, we're subsidizing anyway. So for them, it's a great deal. That works out really well. We often subsidize for, for lunch or for, you know, some appetizers or even, you know, wine with our own money. We can't use your money for that. Uh, but, um, you know, in, in the virtual world, we just decided this semester to start charging for some events, like we have an author coming and we are paying her out of our own funds. And we seem to get a pretty good turnout nevertheless, as long as we keep it down. You don't want to have it. Yeah, it has to be a good deal for them. It has to be something where they really want to go. But it seems to have worked. Another question. It's, only, it's the only, one more thing. It's the only chapter grant funding that is limited to not buying alcohol or equipment. But if you get your rebate and you fundraise, you can use that. Your chapter rebate, you can use that any way you want. Right. We just don't use your funds for that. <laughs> right. The grant funds. Right. Department. Okay. Thank you. Um, another question was about uh, posting on the, um, if they use their own uh, website tools to post to their calendar on their website, does it show up on the national website? And right now it does not. So if you want it on the national website, you would have to submit it through that, that form that we showed you in the chapter resources. It's just chapter resources and then add a chapter event. And this, the form is pretty straightforward. The other question is um, to be, uh, on the board of a chapter, uh, you don't have to be a Fulbright alum, but you have to be a member of the association. Is that correct? And I believe that is correct. Yes. That is correct. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't, if somebody else has questions or sees them, let me, let me know. Munir, you want to also talk about our 75th uh, anniversary submission and what we're doing because I would love the chapters to be to have that advanced knowledge so they start thinking about what they want to do in advance are you talking are you talking about the like um, the the submission? publication yes oh the publication yes okay so um so we are considering it's not finalized but we are considering creating a 75th anniversary uh, publication, which would be like a, maybe a hundred page book. It would look kind of like a coffee book with lots of beautiful photos from 75 years of Fulbright experiences. Um, it would have stories. Um, it would have a lot of photos and um, it would kind of have anecdotes about people's uh, relationships and how Fulbright has changed their lives and keeping in touch with people from the country they visited a long time ago or you know, people getting married because of Fulbright, you know, all sorts of stuff. So anyway, just, just to keep you on, keep this on your radar that we are considering doing this. So if you come across some really amazing stories with your members or Fulbrighters that you know who have really standout stories um, or photographers in your chapter who you think would be willing to donate beautiful photos from their, during their Fulbright um, to this type of publication is just something to keep in mind. Um, and we will, you know, make official announcements later and places to submit, but we just wanted to let you know. And you, you all must have, if some of you who attended our um, 
membership meeting in December, we have launched a new strategic plan for 2021 to 2023. Um, it's very progressive. It's got a lot of mentorship for right in the classroom, a celebrity a commemoration, a 75th commemoration year activities. Um, it's, it's been launched at the start of the 75th. So um, we, our newsletter will have um, a, a sort of summary of it. Our newsletter is going to go out later this week. So please do look at the newsletter to review that uh, because that could be also helpful in your programming and your planning. Um, I would also uh, say that uh, look at the newsletter carefully because any event you want national or global outreach, meaning registrations, people attending, that would be a nice place to put a registration pin uh, button for your event. So um, think of all these resources we have. Um, my biggest request is please, please, please let us know your year plans. We would love to sort of plan everything and coordinate with your plans, existing plans, and also coordinate our plans so that there's no overlap and sort of get uh, the most bang for the programming. You know, as volunteers, you all put in so much time and we just want to make this whole relationship sort of an equal partnership rather than a reporting partnership and sort of tell the story of the Fulbright program this whole year. So please think about how we can help, um, how we can promote your events and how we can partner um, Darlene, in case things get really out of control, um, you could, we could set up our Zoom account for your meeting, um, for your event in April. You know, we could help you with that. So we would we, love it. <laughs> we we have, would love that. I, 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 I'm telling you, we have resources, but if you don't share, you don't ask, you don't know what we could do. So do ask. Um, and if there are expenses that are out of hand and out of control, even there, you can reach out to Christine and me saying, here is our proposal. We just don't have money. And I think I talked to Joe about some of those uh, from Massachusetts. Talk to us, whatever we can do. I'm not, obviously we're limited. Whatever we can do, we'll try. We'll try to make things as best seamlessly flow, as best as we can, uh, as try and take away your burden, try and help as much as we can. Because basically we, we are hand in hand in this together. The chapters are the FA's backbone. I mean, we're all in the same structure together. We, we can't do what without one or the other. So think about all those things in a positive light. Think about what a great year we have a vaccine. We might survive um, mankind and think that we're just trying to get through this year. So how best to tell the story um, together as painlessly as possible and as in a fun way. <laughs> With that, I think I've depressed everybody, sorry. All right, does anyone else have any more questions? It looks like we got, we got to most of them in the chat, but if we have not, please let us know. Claudine? Do you have a question? Uh, yeah, I had posted, <clears throat> is there an automatic notification of renewal of membership so people don't have to think about it or work too hard at it? Yeah, um, members receive um, email notifications when their uh, membership is about to expire, when it has expired, um, but also they can always select the auto renew button as well. So um, we, we tend to keep in touch and then we do have myself and interns, we make calls to members to let them know their membership has been expired as well. So That's good because I know several people and it seems that they kind of lost track. So I will take a look and um, should I have them signing up on the Fulbright Association website to get newsletters and other things or that just come automatically? So if they're a member, they'll be automatically added to our email list. Okay, good. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Sure. Uh, um, Tom, Tom had a good question about um, online event registration. Um, uh, we, um, for event registration, um, 
chapters kind of do their own thing. So some people use Eventbrite, uh, some people have their own platform, some people just use an Excel spreadsheet and email. Um, we haven't yet provided any uh, platform for uh, chapters to have event registration, but we can look into it later. Oh, I have another question. Hi, hi, I have a question. Uh, actually, two questions. One is, how do we obtain uh, a letter from Fulbright uh, documenting the 501c3 status so that our our uh, chapter can obtain uh, tax exemption uh, status from our state? So this, I, I think I answered this, this, um, we don't do the state one, every chapter has to independently apply themselves, but you do have, we can give you our federal exempt status letter official, and we can also write a letter saying, hey, you have this status as yeah. an affiliate under the federal uh, status of ours, um, you know, Please support the the chapter's work, um, and I think Elaine from Maine has been wanting some support on that. They, that they don't even, in some cases, they don't even provide state uh, exemptions. But that is something you guys have to def independently pursue. But you do have a uh, EIN number, and you can use that to say we have, you know, federal exempt status under the Fulbright Association, the parent organization and pursue the local filing yourselves. Right. Well, our state in New Mexico is asking for uh, documentation of uh, that of the parent organization's status with feds. So uh, if I email Christine, Christine. I, could, yeah. I could get that. Okay. The second yes. question is uh, in terms of um, uh, charging for online events, uh, what, what types of uh, payment systems are people using? Because you would have to have PayPal or some type of account where, pay, where registration and payment could be done uh, electronically, or do you have just have people mail checks? Uh, I guess that would be a question for, from the, uh, for the Northern California chapter. Yes, uh, we've been using Eventbrite, and that seems to be working fine. Oh, Eventbrite. Um, I, I could. I, I'm originally from New Mexico, so we have a connection. I was actually president of that chapter years ago when I lived there. Um, I can hook you up with if you'll just shoot me your email. Um, I'll hook you up with our vice president, who knows how to do all of that. I'm not very good with that stuff. That would be great. Thank you. Thank you. Excuse me. May I say something? This is Elaine here. Sure, go ahead, Elaine. Hi. Um, regarding the tax situation, uh, as Shah said, uh, she and I have been in, in contact with that. In our state, as with the um, gentleman who just spoke, it is not a, um, it's not a situation where there's a tax committee and evaluates anything. We barked up that tree for like, I don't know how many years and um, it's a total legislative matter. And for our state, uh, as the gentleman perhaps from New Mexico, uh, we really need a uh, letter from national to key legislators to show them that they need to create a new category for the work our chapter does. So it's not something that we can pursue independently without um, the cooperation of DC. You know, those Mainers, they're just tough nuts. Right. In that case, we have, okay, so this is, uh, yes. And Elaine and uh, uh, Elaine has been so patient with us. Um, it's, uh, it requires us writing a letter to elected officials on behalf of the chapter. It is something we've never done before. So that would be the first. But what we can do is let's start it so that that can be a model that other chapters can use if needed. Uh, but yeah, and I think it works two ways. I think that if we do that, I think indirectly it will, it might take a couple years. It will also help for advocacy 
for all of us in terms of the Fulbright program. So I think it has a double whammy effect if you stay at it. Right, Chaz? <laughs> Yes, it does. It does. And look at what Joe wrote. Maine never should have declared independence. <laughs> well, I, I've, I've been dealing with the, uh, <clears throat> the tax and revenue department directly here in New Mexico. And yeah, the, the paperwork is a little complex and uh, the procedures are a little um, uh, uh, tricky, but uh, Basically, I can just deal directly with them. I would hope that that would be the, the case in, uh, for most states, is that you just could deal with the, the department and not the individual politicians as in Maine. But um, uh, I think I also have to go to the, to the state corporation, uh, or, the, or the, rather the Secretary of State, right. to show that we are a, a corporation or a nonprofit corporation. I haven't, I haven't climbed that ladder yet, but I'll, let, I'll keep you posted. <laughs> so I, I do want to share one thing because of Elaine and gosh, I have much to be gr grateful to Elaine for. Um, she's amazing to work with. Um, I have been talking to our legal counsel about and that's where this bylaws um, edit are coming in, that what can we do to help our chapters not have to do all this work? It's a lot of work for volunteers to be going after, you know, going to IRS doesn't respond. Um, all these tax places are horrible to work with. So um, <laughs> state tax offices have different laws than federal as it is, they hate the federal government in every aspect and don't want to deal with anything federal. So I, I'm aware that there are frustrations. So it's going to take some time, but I think that we this year we will have some closure on having something easy, a process put in place for chapters to easily apply and not have to, you know, go through one phone call to the other to the other office. So thank you and bear with us, but I think we will get some closure to this to make it more automated and simple. Thank you. Um, Rick, did you have a question? I saw that your hand is raised. I did, thank you. And greetings from the newly revived Louisiana chapter. Regarding the 990E, this would be our first year to do it. So I just needed some clarification. Is that somewhere available now? And does it only go to Fulbright or does it go to the IRS or do you send it to us or is it self-explanatory? Just talk about those things, please. So when you, I'm going to jump in because this is going to be the first, uh, Christine's uh, first time as well in, in processing the uh, 990E postcards. You are going to submit it to IRS directly. You will just forward us a copy of the email you get that you filed it. That's all you, with us, you're just telling us you filed it. You're filing it directly with IRS through the 990E postcard, which makes the process very simple. It's just submit the name and EAIN number. Um, and then the confirmation email you forward to us. We in October um, file with the federal government all the notes, we, notices we get from you guys. We, we file all those with, with the federal government, uh, federal process that all these are still active affiliates of ours and they're all in good standing and have been filing their taxes annually. Uh, if you miss filing taxes one year, that's okay. Second year, make sure you do that. If you don't file taxes for two continuous years, I think they make your status inactive. They even bounce you off our list and then there's reinstatement and we have done the reinstatement process. So if ever you guys need that, I'll have more information for that process because we've done it, but it costs, it costs about $450 to reinstate your chapter. Again, it's like a waste of money, don't do it. It's so, so much simpler to just file taxes. So when, 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 you, uh, when you're going through the process, if you have any problems, Rick, let us know. Sometimes uh, the IRS doesn't recognize the EIN number of a chapter because it isn't registered on their end. So you get bounced back. If that happens, let us know because don't worry. We'll, that means we need to fix something on our end. Uh, but you know, 
There's miscommunication everywhere. I hope that's helpful. All right, does anyone have any last questions? Nope. All right. Well, thank you so much for joining us. Um, we're so grateful to have had this time with you today, and it's been lovely to see your faces. Um, if you have any questions, please just feel free to email me at chapters at fulbright.org. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Thank you. Looked in for events. Thank you. Take care. Have a Bye, good everyone. Take care. Tom, do you have a question? Yes, everyone. I thought Tom had a question. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I just wanted to tell folks uh, for the new folk, this is Tom Agustin from Connecticut. If anyone's uh, new, um, as far as the IRS filing goes, it's actually very easy. Don't be intimidated by it. Um, just, I mean, from the discussion, it may sound very intimidating. And I understand on the state side, it can be a pain in the neck. But for us in Connecticut, we don't have any state re filing requirements. And for the IRS, don't, don't be intimidated by it. It's a five minute process once you get on the website with the right information, that's all. And thank you guys for holding this. Thanks Tom. Thanks Tom. Thanks, Tom.